big round of applause. Um, welcome, Paul. Okay. So in just a moment, uh, you should see that uh, my slide's coming up on the screen. And um, before I get started, a couple of comments. First of all, um, thank you so much, Nick, for the, the terrific shout out uh, when you got this presentation started. I'm actually not going to talk too much about ADAPT today. I'll just touch on it very briefly. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk uh, today a little bit more about business model. And very specifically with regard to business model, what I want to talk about is, is maybe two points. Number one, most companies in this space are doing it wrong. And they're overthinking the whole question of decentraliz or centralization and analytics. And number two, not only are they doing their business model wrong, they're doing their architecture incorrectly. Uh, and uh, so that, that's what I'm going to talk about now. And uh, I also would love to say that thanks to the folks at DLA Piper. Uh, I have been a client myself personally. Uh, you guys have been incredibly uh, a great firm for me. And my husband is a tech transactions attorney, actually in Silicon Valley, at Ora Carrington and Sutcliffe. So talking about sort of technology transactions and the, and the legal issues are a big deal. In fact, I uh, I've started my own online movie company. I did that. A little bit over uh, seven years ago now, I left IBM for a period of about uh, nine months and started an online movie company. And I have been sued by every single major movie studio and television station in California. So I, I feel that I have come to learn the hard way the ins and outs of intellectual property management. And uh, my wonderful husband's a great guy. Uh, he never ever once, after my startup went bankrupt, said, I told you so, uh, which is why we are still married, uh, in addition <laughs> to the fact that he's amazing. But let me talk today about IoT, analytics, and decentralization, because I think uh, uh, that the conversation that, that's gone about is incredibly important. And the fact is, as I said before, I think most companies are still fundamentally going about this the wrong way. Now, why does IoT and analytics go together? Um, IoT and analytics go together because you can't talk about IoT without hearing from people who think that the, somehow the golden age of analytics is upon us. And I would say a couple of things. First of all, number one, yes, IoT is coming. In fact, it's not just coming, it's pretty much inevitable. And the reason that it's inevitable is because we have gone out and we have bought billions of smartphones. And the billions of smartphones that we have bought have completely transformed the economics of making smart devices. If you have an S thermostat, as I do at home, right, that device is just an Android phone with a little round cover. Right? Basically, smartphones have become the engine of everything. In fact, smartphone processors are now so ch cheap that it's cheaper and easier to put an entire smartphone in a doorknob, in a light socket, in a switch, Wherever it is, you can put basically an entire iPhone, an original iPhone, in there, and it's cheaper than making a custom embedded chip. So we have reached a really interesting point. It's now cheaper to make things smart than to leave them being stupid. And that is that means that we are going to live in a world where every device is smart, every device has sensors, and it has the potential to generate a lot of data. In fact, the world has become, in my opinion, sort of completely besotted with analytics and advertising. We spend way too much time talking about how much data this or that or the other is going to generate. And companies, in my opinion, spend way too much of their time talking about how much data they are going to collect from their end users. And in my personal opinion, they basically don't understand uh, uh, what they're doing or what their business purpose is, right? Why do we need all this data, right? I would argue that most enterprises have forgotten the fundamentals of economics and information. They are quite literally fighting over stuff that doesn't matter for a couple of reasons. First of all, the economics of information are fundamentally different than what uh, uh, most other businesses look like because the cost to reproduce that information is zero. So unless you have some incredibly unique piece of information, um, you live in a world where your cost of manufacture, an extra copy of that information is zero, and uh, you have therefore infinite supply and finite demand. And if you studied economics, you know that in those situations, the market clearing price is zero. And so I think a lot of companies that have this enormous obsession 
around gathering user data and they think they're going to sell it or they're going to use it for advertising have lost sight of their fundamental business purpose. And I would love to just illustrate that you know, uh, with a, a little chart uh, here. I'll go back to the other page, but I want to illustrate that. Um, Recently, a new washing machine came out. I think actually this is from last year, and it's sold in the U.S. at seventeen hundred dollars, um, and it's got all these great digital features. My personal favorite is the one that allows you to assign laundry tasks to other members of your family. Yeah. Um, there is nothing in the user manual about your ability to make them do them, by the way, but you can assign tasks to other members of the family, and apparently you can remind them until they're just really irritated and planning on divorcing you. But there's an interesting point to this feature, right? It doesn't actually do better laundry. It doesn't do it faster, it doesn't make it cleaner, it isn't better for the environment. In fact, um, all of this brain power is really just used for remote monitoring and connectivity and to pretty much report back to the company what you're doing for reasons that they're not entirely sure about but they would like you to pay for right now. This kind of thing, in my opinion, is pointless. At the end of the day, most people are still going to buy washing machines to get their washing done. They are going to call an Uber or rent a car or summon a self-driving vehicle for the purpose of transportation and not because uh, the value of advertising to them endlessly on their way to their destination is somehow going to be all that interesting. In fact, uh, I would actually argue increasingly large stores of data that companies are cre cre keeping and creating should be seen not as major strategic assets, but substantial strategic liabilities. Um, I think Nick quoted this number of $156 from uh, my former employer, IBM, uh, about the cost, I think, per, per user or per, per record of lost data. Whatever it is, it's, it's, it's a lot of money, right? And it's a lot of risk. And when you start to create these highly centralized data pools, um, it's, uh, it's really, frankly speaking, unnecessary. Uh, in fact, I would argue that when I talk to very smart strategic executives, I believe that the world is slowly turning away from this model of endlessly collecting data. It's time for us to think about how do we get rid of data? What should we not be collecting? And one of my favorites right now is uh, uh, GE's digital division. They have established a really interesting and contrary strategy, which has got a couple of elements to it. The first, and I think the most notable one, is they've said, our customers own their data. We're not going to try to take it. We're not going to try to utilize it. We're not going to try to monetize it to them. When you buy services from GE Digital, uh, there's no gotcha buried in the fine print about who's got access to the data. It's your data. It's your data whether it's on our servers. It's your data whether it's on your servers. But it's your data, and you decide how it gets used. And I think that is a powerful, fundamentally valid approach uh, to their uh, uh, approach to data. Not only is uh, GE thinking very strategically about their approach to data, but in conversations I've had with them, uh, GE is really thinking very strategically about the architecture itself. And this is probably my other big point. Decentralization is uh, not just a good idea, it is fundamental to the strategic shift that's going on in architecture. And uh, the reason for that, and I'll, I'll maybe come back to this, the reason for that is that we live in a world where processing power is absolutely abundant. Uh, we have billions and billions of devices, but trust and security are scarce, right? And so if we want to have resilient, secure, or computing, we need to think about how we use that processing power to do something useful. And I would argue, that the useful thing that needs to be done with all of that processing power is to put assets to work. And specifically, this is what Addict was created for. When I was at IBM, uh, and this is I'm speaking about three years ago, we started to have this conversation. What's the point of the Internet of Things? In fact, a lot of this was sparked by a truly insane conversation I had with the CEO of one of the world's largest white goods companies. And he told me that it was his interest and I, I can't hear what's going on on the other side there, but I hope you're laughing. I, I especially prepared this, these jokes for you. Um, it was his interest, it was his desire to be able to remotely switch on the oven while he was at work so that dinner would be ready for him when he gets home. And I don't know if he ever succeeded in burning down his house or getting food poisoning, but that's my hypothesis. So we used to have these questions. What's the point?
point of the Internet of Things. And in, in my personal opinion, the point of the Internet of Things is to sell stuff, right? And specifically, it's to utilize assets. Uh, and what we observed, what I observed over and over again at IBM is that as we would start to instrument assets, right, put smart sensors and tags on assets, we would learn something very interesting about those assets. Namely, wow, we are not using them very much. Now, if you listen, if you read the press releases of big companies and they talk about IoT, they all love to talk about jet engines and um, all kinds of other stuff that, that, that is used 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. The reality is, is that most assets in the world, and I'm talking about things, for example, like cars or dishwashers or conference rooms, are very poorly utilized. And so there's a logical sequence which says, after I've instrumented an asset, I'm going to want to optimize the use of that asset. And usually I can't, I don't need to drive my car all day and I don't need to run my dishwasher and I don't need to sit in my uh, conference room all day, right? So eventually what that leads to is monetization. I want to put that asset into a digital marketplace. In fact, it's my hypothesis that just about every major asset we have, whether it's an MRI machine or a washing machine or a truck or an office space, they are ultimately going to be electronically tagged, digitally connected, and uh, uh, put into multiple digital marketplaces where you'll be able to buy them, rent them, lease them, obtain insurance, pay for their utilities, capture sense data, you name it, all of that technology will be available uh, uh, to connect up and create value from those assets. And all the research that I've done, all the research and work experience that I have shows that when you connect up these smart assets and you get incremental utilization from that, it's more valuable than almost any other use case. And in fact, where we've been able to sort of test it out, what we found is that incremental utilization by digitally connecting an asset is worth roughly 10 times more than, say, energy efficiency. And we also know that, that many of these assets are very poorly utilized. And I'll just give you a couple of great examples. The average MRI machine in the US, I'm speaking in the US, not, say, the UK, where you have uh, very restricted CapEx at the NHS. But in the US, for example, lots of hospitals have MRI machines. They are busy, on average, only about 25% of the day. That's a multi-million dollar piece of capital equipment that's sitting idle 18 hours a day. The average truck on the road in the US, out of every five trucks, one of them is completely empty. And the other four are on only, on average, only about 80% full, right? That would argue that if we knew where those trucks were going, if we knew uh, uh, how much space they had, uh, we could put those into digital marketplaces, those would become uh, utilized digital assets. Now, how do we put all that together? My argument is what we really need as a, as a substrate for all of this is blockchain technology. And this is how we ended up with the prototype for ADAPT. And ADAPT stood for Autonomous Decentralized, uh, I think it's a peer-to-peer -peer telemetry. But the goal was to connect in a secure, scalable, cost-efficient, decentralized manner devices for the purpose of commerce. And it had three key components. Number one, Blockchain technology, we use the alpha version of Ethereum because blockchains are designed for commerce, right? Bitcoin was designed for commerce, right? So it basically comes with a built-in banking system. Secondly, we put into it BitTorrent for the purpose of large-scale distributed uh, 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 data uh, transmission. And then lastly, Telehash, which is simply a substitute for DNS which uh, we already knew back then was ridiculously easy to take down. But the idea was that blockchain would be the foundation for this, this distributed computing environment. And we modeled it. We did out a bit of modeling. And uh, Nick alluded to this before, but uh, the cost of managing a blockchain-based infrastructure is much cheaper if you distribute it out. All those computers on all of those different systems that are sitting idle, they're basically free. The marginal cost of computing power and storage today is zero if you distribute out the work. And our estimate was you could deploy and scale a distributed blockchain-based infrastructure for 99% less than a traditional server infrastructure. And that 99% number was why Samsung was the first company to partner with us to build a blockchain uh, prototype infrastructure on Addict. Now, Adip was just a proof of concept, and today we have 
real commercial products like MadeSafe and Storage.io and others that are going into service. But it proved out a concept at a remarkably early time uh, that we can securely, safely, and efficiently scale up these technologies. I just want to sort of wrap up here by talking a little bit about my vision for where things are going. I'm a little bit unusual. First of all, you can't tell from the accent, or maybe you can. I'm actually from Sheffield in the north of England, and so is my family. And uh, I'm from a family of nerds. And my mother actually was a mainframe software developer in the 1960s. Uh, and uh, I, I learned a lot from her experience. And if you think about it, the era that she grew up in, that she went to work in, you might think of as the modern era of computing. Computing was expensive, but it was a very high trust environment. In fact, my mother used to fly to New York, uh, to Poughkeepsie, New York, to go to the IBM mainframe factory to uh, visit the engineers and talk to them as the mainframe that she had ordered for Stanford was being uh, put together and prepared to be shipped back to California. Um, and that's a high trust environment. Lots of people, everybody knew each other. You didn't worry about state-sponsored you know, uh, hackers, whether they came from the NSA or the Russian government. It didn't matter. Everybody knew each other and it was a high trust environment. We live in what I think of as the postmodern era. And we live in a low trust environment. But the plus side is computing is now so cheap, it's fundamentally and completely free, right? And we have to stop architecting our products, our business models as if computing was expensive and the most efficient way to manage it is to build this big centralized data center. The most efficient way, the most secure way to build uh, scalable, cost to competitive applications in the future will be using a distributed internet. And as a bonus, those products uh, they will be able to do their own self-diagnostics. They'll be smart enough to do their own analytics. They won't need to pass all that data back to the centralized environment to create you know, what amounts to a digital honeypot for uh, uh, products and services that have, frankly, very uh, dubious commercial value. So that, that's kind of it for me. Um, I can't hear you. I assume you've all been laughing hysterically at the jokes and taking notes because my stuff is fascinating. Uh, I uh, <laughs> tremendously appreciate uh, being invited. Uh, I really love the talks uh, from Nick and John, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me.